Hare Krishna, humble obeisances, Bhakti Vasudev Maharaj. It's Hello, honor Maharaj. to have you on the Monk's podcast. My pleasure. I have read some of your articles online and we interacted also previously on phone. I was born, I was born in Nigeria. I met the devotees in Nigeria. I started preaching in Nigeria. And in 2004, uh, I was invited by Georgia Political Science Association in America to present paper, uh, a research paper at their conference. And then in 2005, again, I was invited by New York Political Science Association, uh, North Carolina Political Science Association, Pennsylvania Political Science Association, um, the American Social Science Association and University of South Carolina, Mississippi for presentations at their conferences. And within these five conferences, uh, I, I, I had to deal with that in a span of six weeks. So that was very intensive. So after those, after those presentations, some devotees solicited that I stay in America to help with academic preaching. And that's how I eventually became a citizen, American citizen, and uh, I, I started living in America. It's amazing how you have been able to present uh, the bhakti philosophy in the contemporary vocabulary and reach uh, circles that previously we haven't reached. So I thought we could discuss about the aspect today of, uh, based on your experiences, how to share bhakti wisdom in today's leadership and management circles. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, something, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting uh, field. Uh, one of those things that I think the ISKCON devotees have not, there's been a gap in, in this area, especially with leadership and management, uh, using the uh, Vaishnava philosophy uh, in providing solutions to leadership and management issues in the global village. So that's what I do. And what happens is that there are so many constructs and concepts in the teachings of Srila Prabhupada and the Vedic literature in general that address contemporary issues in leadership and the management domain. Mm. And so what it requires is one has to be very broad-minded in both fields, and be very broad in terms of knowledge acquisition in the Vedic literature. <laughs> oh, okay. It's been so an exciting. Lost exciting. you for a minute. You said broad in terms of con uh, broad, contemporary knowledge, knowledge and Vedic knowledge. Yeah. Broad knowledge, academic knowledge in the field of management and leadership. Hmm. Leadership, leadership is subsumed in management. It's yeah. just leadership is a discipline, it's a specialty in management. So one has to have broad information culture of leadership and management and at the same time have very broad information culture of the Vedic philosophy. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Then you'll be able to marry, you'll be able to marry both. <laughs> yes, that is true. I think in our movement, uh, His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj was a pioneer in this field. And then you are carrying on his legacy. So can you share some of how you got, how got, you interacted with him and got inspired to embark in this area? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting, a very intriguing uh, question or comment or request. Because, you know, I was, also, I was, keep in mind, I was born in Africa and he had requested me to do this type of, this type of preaching when I was a young promoter. And uh, I started it. <laughs> I started it. But what I realized was that, you know, instruction of the guru might be very difficult. Some of the instructions might be very difficult, but the instruction of the guru, especially the difficult instructions, 
they are encapsulated with empowerment. So I see myself, and I continue to see myself as an instrument by being used by Bhakti Chita in accomplishing his works. Because <clears throat> I can give you an example. I remember when I was going to different from one university to the other doing academic preaching because he, he told me specifically that I should do something, you know, that not everyone is able to do. That was it, what he told me. He said, go and preach to the professors. Not to students, go and preach to the professors. <laughs> Okay. So it was a challenge. It was a challenging. Uh, this was which year, Maharaj? Roughly. Ah, uh, that this was in the early two hundreds. I think either two hundred and two hundred and uh, one or two hundred and two. Uh, two thousand two thousand and two or two thousand and one. I can't remember precisely. But he sent me an email giving me that instruction. And this was based and, on. Uh, your previous academic background or your interactions with him or how did he uh, direct you in this particular way? Uh, before he gave this instruction, I was a media preacher. I was publishing uh, papers, doing the same thing in newspapers, magazines, tabloids, and uh, journals. And so when he saw those potentials, he gave me the order that I should go to preach to the professors. <laughs> oh. And at that time also the same so at that time also the same thing I was doing, except that it was in the in the secular world, not in the not uh, not academic circles. So he saw all of those uh, skillful ways that I was using the uh, teachings of Prabhupada in addressing uh, social, political, and economic issues. And uh, Subsequently, he gave that instruction. And so, yeah, I, I took the instruction, hook, line, and sinker, and I made, I made uh, amazing, uh, you know, I got amazing results. Because the very first, and he, he later was surprised himself how I became so successful in this, <laughs> in the academic uh, uh, preaching, publishing, in peer review journals and presentations at conferences. You know, before even I got my PhD in management and leadership, I remember going to some conferences and presenting papers. And, you know, during question and answers, the professors, they'll be ad addressing me as Dr. Das. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, because I will present. I I will present the papers in a very, you know, a high standard. And so I remember one time I went to one conference with one devotee and the, that conference, it was funny. So that devotee was sitting with, with us in the, uh, on the panel, uh, panel program. I mean, in our sections, but we, the presenters, we are on the panel program, uh, panel seat. And so, <laughs> I, I was presenting my paper. I think that paper was something a little bit high falutin. Uh, and so I was presenting my paper, and uh, and uh, uh, it was about it was on kleptomaniacs. And uh, you know, one of the elderly professors. I think I had spoken for like you know uh, three minutes or four minutes. One of the elderly, elderly professors. He raised his hand. He signaled by raising his hand. He when he had some uh, issues to address. So he said, uh, uh, Das, can you, can you come down to our level? Can you come down to our level? <laughs> All right. So that, that, at that time, I, I was not having a PhD. And so that, that devotee, he couldn't contain himself. So he, he busted out laughing. And so uh, even the professors, they, they saw my skills and uh, they were very friendly. One thing I, I found with you know, academic people or academicians is that ordinarily speaking, if you don't have their degrees or you don't have their skills, you don't have their competencies, they, they despise you. I remember a case in Boston, one devotee, he had no degree and he went to Harvard 
Harvard University. Harvard University is one of the Ivy Leagues in, in the US. Mm -hmm. So he went to Harvard University, they were distributing back to God. And so one young uh, gentleman had, he alighted from his car and uh, he gave him a magazine. And this young, uh, this young, this young gentleman, he talked to him and, and said, and said, don't you know I am Harvard professor? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know what? What have you got to tell me? I'm I'm an Harvard professor. <laughs> he said he was demoralized. It, he turned it turned he turned away from him, and the whole day he couldn't distribute one magazine. So what does this tell on us? It it basically brings to bear that we have to be aware the people we are dealing with. And I've encountered situations similar to those type, that experience with that guy. I remember I went to one university uh, to the head of department that was also in Africa when I was still in Africa. I went to one university to the head of department of philosophy and religion. And I told, I, and I requested him that, you know, if I could uh, talk to his students. And then, uh, and I dressed, you know, I dressed, a bro, you know, fanat like a fanatical brahmachari, dhoti, tilak, and everything. I went to this professor, and he's, he's, a, Christ, he's a Christian university. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so he looked at me, he looked at me up, and looked at, he, looked, he looked down my feet, and he just told me, we don't do this here. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. <laughs> So what so I pause. we need to earn yeah. respect in their eyes before we can actually enter into their circles. And yeah. one way to enter respect is by either learning their language or getting their degrees or comporting ourselves in a way that they will find at least acceptable, if not respectable. Sure, that's it, exactly. And so, <laughs> yes, <ma 'am. laughs> so when, when he tried to mess me up in that way, when he despised me in that way, I pause a little, and then, because I also I was also pretty young in my early thirties, hmm. so I paused a little, and I leaned forward and told him, you know, mildly, softly, that excuse me, sir, better have twenty-five publications and peer-reviewed journals in three years. So he was taken aback. He was shocked, and he softly, softly said. Can I see some of those journal publications? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the next day, Chetanya, listen, the next day, I came with three, just only three, three journals and showed it to him. I flipped through one of the first one, I showed him my paper. I, I flipped through the second one, I showed him my paper, and the third one, I showed him my paper. And those three journals were from the highest university in the country. But then it turn, they turned the tables around. You know what? You know what he said? His response to that was that when when are you coming to make your presentation? <laughs> oh, God. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. That's amazing. So Maharaj, what kind of topics do you take when you get present in mainstream journals? So like earlier you mentioned kleptomania. So that's yeah. an interesting subject. So how do, you, <laughs> how do you connect that with spirituality? Yeah, kleptomania or kleptocracy, you know, government leaders, they steal from their country's, uh, you know, national powers. So klepto, kleptomania, simply some, a government leader who steals with his pen and his brain. And we have a solution. And what is our solution? Is uh, what basically I present as a solution to that. But you keep in mind that I have to discuss with them all about kleptocracy. Okay. I will quote, I will make references to other scholars who have written on kleptocracy and all those things, and then provide a solution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because in, in academic writings, especially in management, in management science, hmm. you have to identify a problem. Yeah. Then 
you have to provide a solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. And even before you provide a solution to that problem, you have to have a research question. What is it that you're going to investigate? And the purpose of your, purpose of your investigation, the purpose of your study. Before you come to literature review, and then you, know, you generate your, your the strategies that have developed from your investigation about the solution you know, to this very problem. So we have a number of cases where we could always pick up something from, pick up some concept or construct from purpose writing and address these, these issues. Like the case of cryptomania uh, or cryptocracy. Okay, okay. I use a basic, a basic simple, simple uh, construct that we use every day and that is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. The chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra purifies the heart. But I have to use a language that is acceptable to the professors because chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is a purely religious, a religious uh, you know, conception. Hmm. And so these are people who don't believe in religion. In most cases, I deal with political scientists. Of course, in the early days, I was you know, also dealing with uh, professors in philosophy and religion. I refer to the, I mean, I refer to the uh, Hare Krishna Mahaman to ask sonic therapeutic intervention. I know these are very, very, you sonic know, alluring intervention. terms. <laughs> <laughs> these are very alluring terms to the academicians. Okay. And, uh, you know, they accept. But I will explain even the, the 32 syllables of the mantra and explain all these stuff. And, you know, by Krishna's grace, by the grace of Bhakti Chaitanya Swami and Srila Prabhupada, you know, they've been accepting our presentations, publishing them, and then, um, you know, relating with us as one of them. But we have a mission on their very grounds. So, you know, this is very creative. So you are saying that if you just learn to articulate so the three steps, if I understand right, first is that we study the issue properly and then we show them that we know the subject that we are not just, uh, we know the subject and then we present our solution, but in terms that don't seem sectarian or religious. Hmm. So, and uh, is that right? <laughs> And then do we need to quantify this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I normally say, ah. how do you quantify this? Can we show that, say, some people, some leaders, they had the sonic therapeutic intervention and they became better leaders or something like that? Won't they require some quantification? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because scientific means, you know, you have to quantify, you have to quantify and qualify. <laughs> so how would you do that? That's... Where, that, is where, that is where you show your expertise. So for instance, I did, I did some work on uh, uh, political sex as conventional morality approach. Now, this is a work that is very good for brahmacharis. And because I don't advertise my works or I don't advertise myself, a number of people may not, take, may not know, but it's a very good work. If it's a very good publication for brahmacharis. What is the publication? It's, it's, that, <laughs> it's that of post um, political sex scandals. Political hyphen, sex scandals, okay. Hyphen post conventional morality approach. Okay. Now, in this very in this very publication, in this very study, I did some work and I even interviewed p practitioners of you know, sonic, uh, uh, sonic uh, therapy or the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So I did some uh, investigation on that and brought that in. And what is required in scholarship or in the management sense is, is research, especially the honor, the honor scholars who go, who go out to the field and do some research instead of just writing an essay. Okay. So I incorporate that research into the work but you know what, people who are, or scholars who are addicted to illicit sex, they didn't like it. But then the same work, 
<laughs> yeah. The same work was very much a is is still very much cherished by those who are a little bit pious because the pep the the study is big giving you an understanding how you could become free from getting involved in political scandal and losing your job, losing your reputation and all this stuff. So some research study was also inputted there and it made a lot of a lot of positive difference and it was published. In fact that journal I published it with uh, uh, with uh, one multi multi multidisciplinary multi and multi yeah multidisciplinary journal and uh, it's there it's there on the net that anyone can have access to read uh, post um, i mean political sex scandals uh post, post conventional i mean uh post conventional morality approach okay so this is fascinating maharaj now so when you said you interviewed those who are practicing sonic thera therapeutic intervention that means you basically in, uh, interviewed leaders in the devotee community? Yeah, people who are practicing. Not, <clears throat> not, necessarily, not necessarily leaders, uh, devoted leaders, but devotees who are professionals and who have been chanting. And so what do they gain from this? Does it help them to, uh, you know, does it help to protect them from getting involved in illicit sexual relationships at work or whatever? Okay, so then, so this is based solely on their self-assessment? Yeah. If they say that this is protecting me, then yeah. that itself is considered enough? Of course, that is a qualitative research. A qualitative research means, you know, you want to get, that's a qualitative research and it could be, uh, it could be approached from a phenomenological perspective. Phenomenological approach means that someone has some experience. That approach of study in the management science. <laughs> oh, so you don't need like a control group, like what a is control that? group? Control group. That is another, 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 another aspect to it. A quantitative, a, a quantitative research requires, in some cases, require a control group. But it's not all research that you need a control group. Oh, okay. Yeah, some of the research, you will only interview people, and some of them, you will have to make a control, uh, you will have to have a control group to make an assessment, to validate what you are professing. In other words, you have to have some hypotheses and all the rest of that. Oh, but okay. in, the qualitative, in the qualitative approach, you don't, need, you don't need a control group in most cases. You don't need hypotheses in most cases. You have a you have a problem. You are addressing. You have research questions. You are addressing, and you know you have to be able to align the research question with your problem statement, and of course the purpose of your study. Oh, okay. So you don't even necessarily need to document a transformation in people, like say you discuss somebody's case five years ago and now five years later whether that person has transform their behavior, even that is not so much required. It is just a self-assessment is considered enough. It's in some cases that you see what you, there are, <laughs> there are, there are cases, there are studies that you, you will need to, you need, you need a backlog and say 10 years ago, a follow-up of study. That is called a longitudinal study. Yes, longitudinal study, yes. So, but you know, so research is, is, I mean, there are diff, there are so many approaches to research. And depending on what you choose to, uh, uh, to use as uh, your method and approach you use, that, uh, keep in mind, this same problem statement could be approached quantitatively, could be approached qualitatively, could be, you could use a quantitative method, you could use a, or a qualitative method or, or mixed methods approach. You see, this is how we were, we were trained and, you know, the, the, you were asked to, you know, approach, deal with this problem, deal with this research problem, research, uh, um, yeah, this, uh, problem statement, deal with, deal with this problem using qualitative uh, method. Deal with this, then the same problem, you can deal with it using a quantitative method, quantitative. where you use, you know, uh, control groups and all the rest of it. Yes, Maharaj. 
so then now this is clear so when you use sonic therapeutic intervention so then now that could involve say sonic can involve any kind of sound so when you specifically say recommend the hari krishna mantra so doesn't that content of the sound bring in some sectarian connotations so why this particular sound mm. how do you explain that yeah that's an, that's an interesting stuff you explain that because i mean to explain that based on the fact that there have been studies conducted with this very 32 syllable mantra for instance for instance was in 1999 at university florida state university conducted, yeah, david brian wolf did that here yeah. conducted a research on uh, the you know uh, the effect of the Hare krishna mantra on uh st is it stress and de uh, depression or something like that and the gunas so that, that was a quantitative quantitative research where he had control groups yes so those type of establishments i mean the people the, 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 for the non scholars uh they don't non scholars in our movement they don't know the the the, the potency of that type of work because it is something that stays on mm. even after being a current study it becomes a classical a classical study or uh, because you may have a contemporary uh, research within the past within the uh, past five years hmm. after 20 years people still make reference to that work especially when you have it quantified or qualified in those uh, uh, in those type of systems and you have done all of these works or published so that becomes some is 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 an authority. Prabhupada also had demonstrated the importance of the man mantra changing hippies to happies, potheads and drug addicts to you know saintly people. So you can also make a reference to the Veda base citing Prabhupada as one of the uh, one of the researchers or one of the authorities who have used this man mantra in changing lives or in transforming people see when you have that <laughs> when you have the technical know-how the whole of the very literature becomes you know a tool in your hand to be able to provide a solution mm. to some problems in the material world and we have our devotees are not doing enough because even in the management science we find people who are not of the Vaishnav tradition, especially from India, the scholars, they have done so much of work with on the Bhagavad Gita. They've mm -hmm. done, so, just Google Bhagavad Gita management. You will see works that have been published. Our devotees in most cases are not in those areas. I have a number of friends in India who are young uh, PhD holders, in management and you know uh they are very much interested in my works and you know some of them they're trying to learn how to be able to bring in the the Vaishnav philosophy into their works my research shows that uh non vaishnavas or non iskon devotees non vaishnavas you know in india people majority of people no read Bhagavad Gita. I can't say everybody because I have not I've not conducted uh yeah. a research. We are careful with choice of words in hmm. <laughs> in management science. So majority of people have read Bhagavad Gita and I've seen some people have written I, I remember the case even I bought that book I don't know where I, where it's been over 10 years ago. I bought that book in uh, in India and Bhagavad Gita and leadership. So this gentleman, he was he was pointing to the some of the slokas in the Gita, which uh, which are suitable for leadership development. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we 
So this was an academic book or a, means this is a academic book or it is like a popular press ah uh, it's it's not an academic book okay i a professor wrote it but somebody who just interested in being a publisher or being an author okay okay yeah. yes but i've also i've also seen i've also seen some some a uh, professor uh a, a, a professor emeritus from Harvard University he did some uh, uh some some leadership uh book uh based on bhagavad gita some bhagavad gita sutras yeah so people are doing all of this they are not your devotees <laughs> so they may interpret they may interpret krishna to the general mass of people in a different way yeah so our devotees should also brace up uh in the field of the management science to see how we are portraying the the image of krishna as a personality a supreme personality of god to the masses of uh, to uh, to the public mm. and that is easily uh done in the academy because something that is published in academic journal it becomes an authority yes and so those people who do not even uh have uh, allegiance to krishna's ba- krishna bhakti they are doing this type of wonderful service hmm. i say wonderful service because they are making at least bhagavad gita known to yes to right. the mass or to the public so quoting so, bhagavad gita also is not a problem it is not seen as a religious book or it, how do you position the bhagavad gita uh in those cases they are the position the bhagavad gita as a religious text a classical text and a text for management support systems <laughs> oh okay for management <laughs> support systems management support systems oh okay that's interesting yeah. okay so when uh, you so the scholars the scholars are very good at what jog papa said scholars are very good at word jaggery you know yes that's so, <laughs> uh but in some cases bhagavad gita is presented those who are coming from religious background bhagavad gita is presented purely as a religious text because you're talking to a religious audience yes yeah yeah so this is a because many times devotees or people who are favorable to bhakti they approach me and they say that just yesterday i was talking with one person who wants to do his phd in bhagavad gita and leadership and he's asking me whether there is existing research and how i can go ahead so quality yeah, yeah. is a very good field in which it's a good field yes and overall so now say the sonic therapeutic intervention can mean chanting the holy names what other strategies or what are the practices can we introduce uh ah, another thing you know one of my current research i just submitted a proposal for uh a leadership conference that is coming up coming uh coming up uh, at my university university uh, world university in uh in the united states so uh one of that if you read my if you read my published works especially on kleptocracy you see the different constructs that i use for instance in the bhagavad gita the the, the series of the two texts that krishna was uh um, uh addressed the issues of why why people act against the better judgment by contemplating on the object of the senses one develops mm. attachment yeah so i use those two texts that one on the next text as a, a model in demonstrating why people are involved in financial financial fraud <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> that's amazing because the point is you see there are three levels of knowledge one the primary level of knowledge is that we read the vedic literatures okay we acquire knowledge we know what is bhakti what is not what is good and what is bad what is reactive what is proactive and then the next phase is 
what scholars have, the discussion of scholars on that very team. Like we have our chariots, they made some commentaries. Okay. Uh, they, have diff, uh, they have commentaries on Bhagavad Gita and all these things. So that is the next level, second level. And then the third level, that is called contemporary, contemporary issues. And then the third level is application. Now, so we have from theory to contemporary issues and then to the application. Now, on the application level, that is when you talk about, you know, how to use what you have productively to address issues. In the management science, we don't just talk on essays. What is the problem you are trying to address? Hmm. So it's different from, you know, giving a class, a guitar class, they know me at the repeating. Okay, so. Repeating is a very good team. Yeah, so the problem you are addressing, say, in that case is, uh, is greed or what did he say? The Hayato Vishay and Pumsa, the 262, you used it for addressing? Ad addressing financial fraud. Financial fraud, okay. <laughs> so that's fascinating. Why, for instance, why I use that and um, another a theorist, the general theory of crime, in my concept of framework, and the board frameworks explain what is a purely spiritual concept of framework from the point of view of Krishna or from the Bhagavad Gita. Another is from criminology. So you see where the, the devotee academic has to be broad, broad based in his information culture. So I use these two constructs, I mean, these two uh, frameworks as my conceptual framework in that study. And, you know, it sounds so amazing, <laughs> so, so, so amazing, you know. <laughs> now, I use those two verses as, as a model. Yeah. So the preaching with a back to, back to spirituality, back to philosophy, it requires a lot of self-intellectual interrogation. Hmm. It's completely different from sitting down to chant 108 rounds. Every time you have to be cracking your brain, to, you have to be innovative. Hmm. It's complete. I know a number of PhD holders in our movement, MBAs, uh, uh, DBAs, and even, I mean, a, a number of PhDs in psychology. But how do you use your academic acquisition? How do you bring in your spiritual ideologies into your presentation? That is the challenge. And not everyone is able to do that. Yes, Mara, that's true. At best, you can publish in your area to be able to get publications and get promotion and all this. Thing. But how do you bring the Bhakti philosophy? How do you switch in the Bhakti concepts and constructs into your presentation? That is a skill and competency that you need to be empowered to, to function with. You need to be uh, able to, uh, mm. to get, to, get uh, to, to acquire that information, perhaps through the mercy of your spiritual master, through the mercy. Because in my case, I was directly given an instruction to do this. Mm. So I don't see myself as being the doer. I see myself as being just an instrument in the hands of my spiritual master and the hands of Prabhupada. And if I tell you stories, some of the stories, you will laugh and laugh and almost roll down from your chair. I'll give you an example. I will, I'll, I'll give you an example. A minute, if you don't mind. I just wanted to go back to your three, three level analysis. So you said mm -hmm. uh, three levels of knowledge. First is like study of scripture, then connection. That's a theoretical, that's a theoretical understanding. Theoretical, then then uh, correlation with contemporary issues and then uh, application for solving application means solving problems sure uh, how we can what can you offer as a solution to a problem yeah based on the theoretical based, yeah. based on the theories that you have learned in the gita 
okay. based on the commentaries of the Acharyas, okay. integrating both the theories and the commentaries of the Acharyas, how do you apply that to solving a problem in a real world situation? Yes, so then, <laughs> just, I understand this. So when you said that, say, financial fraud, that's a problem in the real world. And yeah, then I'm, the, I'm just giving, yeah, I'm just giving that as an example. Yeah, so surely. And then, so the Hayato Vishaya and Pumsa 6262 is the scriptural verse. And then the, so how you apply it is by talking about how contemplation, say, kindles greed, and then how it yeah. needs Okay. <laughs> and then what is the corrective measure or what is the solution in that? How would you present that? <laughs> Allow me to laugh, of course. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's intriguing because, I mean, your questions are very intriguing. They, 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 they give me a sense of humor and then, you know, <laughs> opportunity to be able to explore more on you know the type of uh uh you know explorations that have been involved in over over the years so yeah Lord krishna mentioned in, in those two verses how one gets into trouble <laughs> <laughs> that's true okay financial fraud is a crime hmm. how do you become involved in a crime like financial financial fraud, by based on Krishna's ideology, based on Krishna's framework, by contemplating on yes, Maharaj, yes, financial fraud, how to get how to get money quick quick fix. Yes, by contemplating on that, you can develop attachment to it. Yeah, but what would be the solution here then? And what would be the solution? Not contemplate. What would be the well, this the, 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 it's already it leads you to a problem. So you are, you can either change your thought your thought pattern your con, your object of contemplation is the major issue. What is your tell me your object of com, contemplation and I will tell you where you are going where it's going to land. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that we have to have you know purified contemplation. Association, even mentally, with the object of the senses, could trigger situations where we will act against our better judgment. Therefore, we have to be careful about what we contemplate on. So you can wo use words like object, sense objects, and everything in the academic world also. Yeah, but I don't use sense objects. I use, <laughs> I use. I use terms like uh, sensory modalities. Sensory modalities. Yeah. That's clever. <laughs> <laughs> I think you yourself enjoy coming up with words like these to present our concept. <laughs> but that these are the words that are applicable in psychology and the management sciences. Hmm. Sensory modalities, it, it, also, it means the sense objects, but it is in a more sophisticated, you know, uh, 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 application. You know, I remember. And the scholars, the scholars, they want things sophisticated. When there's, when the things are sophisticated, then they say, "Oh, you're a real scholar." <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You know, I remember uh, I read one of Bhakti Maharaj's books. So there he talks about basically sense control, but the title of that chapter was Harnessing Sexual Energy for World Peace. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant <laughs> title. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you have to you have to bring up something that addresses mm. real world situation. Because the philosophy is there, okay? But how does that apply to solving a real world problem so that is how he wrote his his books yes maharaj maharaj just going to a little bigger picture now that you know with respect to say academic outreach there are different areas in which outreach can be done so i have noticed that there are some devotees who are interested in the field of science and spirituality there are some devotees who go into maybe religious studies directly and then they go into 
they may of course go through history approach or sociology approach or something like that but uh, it seems that uh, this approach of say going through leadership studies or political science approach this doesn't seem to be have, have been charted by many devotees of course we don't have any devotees in academia itself but still science and spirituality seems to be like a well known field also religion religious studies is one field but this political science approach has not been tapped much so are there devotees in this field or if there are not say if some devotee wants to enter in this field what would be the trajectory they follow ah uh, you see we have we have devotees like even in india we have devotees who are even professors of management but they're not doing what i'm doing they don't have those type of skills and competences okay so yeah there are devotees who are, who are professors even right here in india i know a number of them who are professors in management who are you know phd's in management so that people need to uh, get some specific a specific uh, advice or instruction from their authorities you see because one of those things is that if we choose if we just choose to do something i didn't choose to do what i am doing hmm. and that is why even the results i don't claim the results because you can ask any professor have they heard of someone who have published 25 publications in in academic journals in 3 years very rare but that period was like a crazy zone for me sometimes i would be chanting japa uh, in early morning period and some idea shoots into my head and i would drop the japa and run up here to start writing so it was like it was like a danger zone like a war front but the result is what basically stands as you know uh a legacy today and so we need we need we need to walk with our spiritual masters mm. and those spiritual masters you see one thing with bank jesus swami maharaj was that he was very he has expertise in talent management he engaged people according to their proclivity according to their talent he is he's, he he was also very perceptive he mm. he will figure out he will perceive what the background you are coming from and how to engage you Mm. the potentials you have and how to engage you so in that way uh it becomes easy and you see i was a temple president that some point in time I had to resign from the presidency and the voters were agitating that you know bring him bring basil back to be a president because he's very productive in you know generating funds and building building temple so i remember him <laughs> announcing in, just after mongarati normally he used to read something and then make some announcement so that day he said asking vasudev to become a president again is wasting vasudev's time wasting krishna's time wasting guru's time so that stopped the devotees from agitating hmm. because he wanted me to do a particular thing and people the devotees we are only thinking about the immediate the immediate thing they can the resource they can get That's from this guy yeah. So we need to work my point is we need to work with people our leaders who have expertise in talent management and being able to engage people based on their uh, proclivities yeah that's true. Then this it makes the journey very swift yeah there are two things over here one is that as you said often we have certain preconceived definition not pre predefined ideas of success so like say as you said raise funds or distribute books which are all important but then those are those are quick results or in some ways quicker and these are in this field the results are less subtler so first of all we need some supportive leadership who will actually recognize the value of this kind of service exactly yes now in your case say you know you were close to maharaj knew you you were close to you you are close to him also but nowadays in our movement we have become very big we have a limited number of spiritual masters and uh, quite often 
devotees don't get such customized guidance from any senior devotee or level on their spiritual master so often devotees have to take their individual initiative of course they may take blessings and something from the spiritual master but it's unlikely that they will get a specific instruction so in some ways the initiative seems to come more on the devotee how do i engage myself in a way that is that is that is the most productive for krishna hmm. so yeah that that to ad, to address that issue still the devotees for instance is someone our leaders need to be trained that's one that's one major point we a number of our leaders we tend to we tend to be too myopic we need we we want to do things that give us immediate result in america they say quick fix yes <laughs> that's true and i've also seen devotees who are doing a phd i remember one indian gentleman uh in chicago some years ago i didn't even remember but then when he graduated he was telling someone he came to new york and he was telling someone about how i helped him so this devotee again the way we preach in our communities is very anti academic <laughs> and it's not academic yeah what, what I, i'll give you an example yeah please I was in I was in a Delhi temple, Sisudata Patasar temple. I used to go there. Uh, in fact, in America, I used to tell devotees that I'm, I'm more of a Delian than a New Yorker, because in, in Delhi, <laughs> I used to stay in Delhi temple for for a long time. So, I mean, yes. So, and my every I I go to bottom class and. When I was going to finish the class, I mentioned some things about motivating people based on their inclinations, based on what Guru has instructed them, based on their talent, and based on their competencies and skills. And after the class, and that is completely adverse to most of the um, type of preaching that we do. So after the class, one young lady. She she came to uh, to the guest house to see me with another of my friend. That friend, she and her husband. So this young lady, she came with that lady to see me, and then she came to me to that she came to thank me. I said to thank me for what? I don't even know you. What did I do that you come to thank me? She said, she's a disciple of Gopal Krishna Maharaj. She said she received an instruction from his uh, Guru Maharaj, Gopal Krishna Maharaj, to do. A doctorate. She is on the doctorate program, but the preaching that she was hearing around it was completely counterproductive to her efforts. In other words, it's like she was a Maya. But this is what the Guru had told him to do. I told her to do. So I said, "Well, we have this in all places that people they to do, they will like to do." And what the Guru has asked you to do, or what you are capable of doing. So we have to change our mood and be a little bit more. The leaders have to change. The preachers have to change their mood and be a little bit more, uh, you know, more, more, uh, more outbound in, instead of just being too, you know, uh, in inbound in only. We should see how. the society will grow based on a bigger population living outside mm. who are grihastas that not everyone is going to be a pujari everyone is not brahmanically cultured there are some people who are interested in learning and the children who are giving birth to children they have to see how they don't just push all of their, their kids to the temple to go and be you know full time devotees or just to go to gurukul and end up there because you know not everyone is going to be satisfied with just being a pujari this movement golokera prema dan harinam sankirtan this movement is coming from the spiritual world and people who are part of this movement they are coming from different dimension the preachers of this movement must know must understand this basic fact and not be monolithic in their preaching programs it's beautiful what you see Yes ma'am. How we are encouraging our communities to invest in productive ways in uh, motivating their families, 
to become higher achievers. Because I give you an, an example in this respect. Now, there's, when I went to South Africa one year, a, a, a young couple hosted me. And the both of them, they had uh, one of the husband was a management, uh, energy management scientist. The wife was a, a computer scientist. The wife worked, was working at that time with uh, a computer research, computer research uh, industry. So she was, uh, she was just in that office. She was not preaching. She was just in her her work as a, a, research, a computer research scientist. But the whole of the office, they know her as a completely a different young, beautiful lady. Completely different. Because she doesn't smoke, drink, uh, I mean, eat meat or fish or eggs. So they see her as someone very, very in their office. She didn't preach. Just see the value of planting a devotee in an office of elites. One day, another of her teach her what she is practicing. That's how she got to teach that lady devotional, uh, devotional service, bhakti, teaching her how to chant, how to have a, 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 feeding, a, a feeding pattern of life and all these things. So during the breaks, they will go to some corner of the compound and then they will be chanting there together. Just by having someone in an office of elites mm. whose life is completely different. And just by her presence, she made a devotee in that office. And okay. therefore, we have to see how we are encouraging people to go ahead and not create a barricade that, you know, like a ceiling that, oh, no, 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 this is, this is, where, <laughs> this is where you have to go. <laughs> this is the level you have to be. <laughs> So that devotee in Chicago, she was, he was doing a PhD in some science field, I think electrical engineering or mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, I don't know what transpired, but I went to Chicago and then he approached me that he wants to, he wants to drop out from the program. That boy from, he was from, he, he came from India. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I said, see, whatever you want to do about your studies, I know that that's your choice, but understand that you came here with a mission. You came from India to Chicago with a mission, and your parents are expecting you to accomplish that mission. Now, whatever challenges you are having in your PhD program, don't drop out. You make sure that you persist and finish this program. Then you'll be more useful to your parents your family and your community and more useful to the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So I left him. I gave my words and I left him. He went ahead. He finished his program. And one time he came to New York and he was telling me, the person he was speaking to was my personal assistant. He's doing a PhD, in, a doctorate in finance. So he was discussing with that boy a black boy, and then he told him that, oh, this is what Vasudev, Vasudev Maharaj did to me when I was doing my studies. So the boy told me, I said, I don't even know the guy. <laughs> so my point is that we should not limit ourselves so much because any devotee and their resources are useful to the upliftment and the spreading of Lord Chaitanya's mission. Yes, ma'am, this is a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a, another important point that, as you said, we have a almost anti-academic ethos. That means, or you could say anti-achiever -ach ethos, that rather than encouraging devotees to engage their talents and move forward, often we expect them to just directly contribute to the movement by, in certain standard ways. So do you feel that... Uh, now, uh, within the institutional framework, it is possible for people to uh, f get that space. Like say, now you are, you are in Saffron and you were given by your spiritual master the instruction and with that you got some space also for doing it. 
So there is uh, sometimes some devotees feel that the institution uh, it sometimes suppresses individual initiative, and when one wants to do something which is uh, which is you could say somewhat innovative, go into uncharted territory, then uh, sometimes uh, one doesn't get the necessary encouragement. So in your experiences, as well as in your advice to others, you now how would you encourage, how would you suggest that individuals with this kind of uh, maybe academic zeal or in general, some special talents, how can they navigate that path forward? Yeah. Uh, uh, the way, the, my advice to such people is that if they are living in the temple, they must have to coordinate their ideas with their authorities. Okay. Now, if they are not living in the temple, I mean, like in my case, I was a brahmachari, but I was in, this idea was imposed on me by my guru, okay? And I remember <laughs> it was imposed, and he told me that the service I've given to you, I know it's difficult, but if you don't do it, you will not be happy. I mean, like a curse. He told me that. He said, this is a very difficult task. Oh, God. But if you don't do it, you will not be happy. That's what he told me. That's what he told me. <laughs> so, the relationships we have with our authorities may be different. And their intention, the intentions of the authority, the foresight, their vision, and their goals for us may be different. But then the idea is that if we are living in the Vaishnav community in a, in a temple, whatever innovative ideas we have, we have to be able to work it out with the authorities. Mm -hmm. this is, that is what makes uh, an institution. I mean, it's like you work in a company, you have an innovative idea, you discuss it with your supervisor or with your boss. And then you should be able to convince him about you know, your innovative idea. Hmm. Okay. So we may have a good idea, but we don't have that potency or we don't have that, uh, that zeal to be able to sell that idea to someone in a convincing way. And then we think, oh, he's oppressing me. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. That's very mature, Maharaj. So first you mentioned how leaders shouldn't be so myopic, but then now you are also placing the responsibility on the individuals that we have to be able to, in a sense, market our ideas effectively, rather than sure. simply blaming the, blaming the leaders for not giving scope. But we, exactly. have to, we have to learn to market our ideas. After all, if we are going to the outer world, yeah. we'll have to market the ideas there. So if we can't market it to devotees, then if you can't explain it to our authorities, how likely are we to be able to explain to others? <laughs> All right. Um, so, as we lost a little time in between because of that network issue, so I don't want to extend you beyond your time. How much time do we have? Then, accordingly, I'll plan the next few questions. Uh, two questions is fine. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. So, now you mentioned earlier that. Uh, that even those scholars who have brought, who interacted Bhagavad Gita with management, uh, they have also done some service. Although they have not, they may not have exactly given the traditions understanding of Krishna. So this is a, this is quite an inclusive approach. There is one understanding that you know we should be introducing the Bhagavad Gita exactly as it is presented in the tradition. But another understanding is that at least Bhagavad Gita is coming into people's intellectual horizons. And they are at least aware of it. So, how, to what extent uh, have you seen this positive negative effects? Let's say sometimes people get, uh, people present Bhagavad Gita in an innovative way, but then they may go too far. So, are there any um, guidelines you would like to suggest for this? Yeah, uh, the, point, the point is that, the point that I was making earlier was that there are so many impersonalists. <laughs> yes. We use the Bhagavad Gita to preach, hmm. but they don't accept Krishna as the supreme personality of God. Yeah. Now, for those of us who are worshiping Krishna as the supreme personality of God, 
it behooves us to generate ideas. We should use those people as a motivating factor to be able to go into the field and see how we can present Krishna as he is. Yes, that's true. That's beautiful. And so are there, say, for example, you said we can, we can give a better understanding of Krishna. So one thing is self-transformation or say addressing social issues. So if we call this as more like utilitarian philosophy or utilitarian spirituality, uh, people are interested in that right now. And do, uh, but we are interested in saying giving transcendental philosophy. In a sense that we want people to connect with Krishna as a person and develop love for him. So, is the are the people who are interested in utilitarian philosophy? How likely are they to come to the transcendental philosophy, or just mm. they're accepting utilitarian philosophy is also a good thing, and we can be satisfied with that? <laughs> yeah, you see, what happens is that the preacher should be making relationships. Okay. The preacher should be making relationship. Either you're moving around trying to plant the seeds of the Bhagavad Gita philosophy or the Vedanta philosophy, we should be friendly. By being friendly, people come close to us and they will they will learn our ideas, our way of operation, our manner of operation, our lifestyle, and they will become friends. They will want to do what we are doing. They will want to follow our lifestyle. They will want to study our philosophy on a deeper level. So the watchword there is that we should try to be in this position when we be we wish personal, we should create an avenue where we are reachable, that we are accessible, and we don't create a purple bull of demarcation between the big guy and the small guy. <laughs> oh. Otherwise, if that accessibility is there, then very easily, very easily, people come to learn about you and they'll see you as their friend and their loved one and not just their authority. Nobody likes authority in the 21st century. You think people like Trump? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, we may have very uh, powerful philosophy, but we should also be friendly. We should be accessible. And that way people come close to us and Someone will decide, like that lady in the office, I want to be like you. Teach me how to be like you. Mm. That's how it works. So you're saying that in one sense, if you envision it like a pyramid or a funnel, then the academic outreach creates the awareness and helps provide the opportunity to develop relationships. And it is through those relationships that people will grow. Sure. Yes. Yes, man. I think that's... See, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you an example. In the early days, when I started uh, publishing in, um, in academic journals, I was dealing with uh, one a professor. He was the head of department for classics and the editor-in-chief of a multidisciplinary and a multicultural journal. So in the early period, uh, he had a lot of interest in my works to the point that he wanted me to uh to to, uh, to give him to present a study or a paper uh for all all volumes of his uh, journal <laughs> that's a very challenging part challenging task but the point is that i was very friendly with all of all of the uh, all of his office uh people his secretaries and everything else so each time I'm going there, I will, be, I will make sure at some point in time, the relationship became very close. So I was, I was, uh, I was bound to ensure that each time I'm going there, I, I get some, you know, I take some prasad from the 
uh, from the restaurant to be able to give to the secretaries and to the editor in chief. But you know what? The effect of that was that <laughs> it came to a point that if I go to, the, to that office without any prasada, the first thing that even the professor will ask is, where is it? Where is the prasada? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that professor, he helped us so much. You can't talk any ill about the Hare Krishnas in his presence. You cannot. And he's not a devotee. He's not a bhakti, you know, he's not a bhakti vedantist. As a professor of classical studies, he loved Prabhupada's teachings. He will want to be like, you know, live in the temple, but, you know, he had a big family. One of his one of his children was even a medical doctor. I remember one time he told me, oh, Vasudev, now I've seen your secrets because you are, you, are, you are celibate. So that's why you're very proficient in your writing. All right, this weekend, I'm not going home. I want to be celibate. I want, you know, I want to be detached. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, so he didn't go home that after after school on Friday, and on Monday he told me that he was trying to I was trying to be like you, but unfortunately my wife came on Saturday and bullied me out of the office to the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay. So, so he could tell me all those type of deep, deep social, you know, interactive affairs in his in his family because of our relationship. Mm. So my point is that when we are preaching, we should understand at the back of our mind that relationship building is very important to enabling people to become lovers of Krishna or lovers of the devotees. Yes. This is a very sweet way to a concluding point. Uh, ultimately, people can experience love for Krishna through the love that they get with devotees. And everything that we do is meant to get, get them to that point. I'll quickly try to summarize. And if you have any okay. concluding words. So we discussed today on the topic of uh, you know, taking bhakti wisdom into the leadership, into the management leadership field. So you shared your journey, how it started with Bhakti Dhrit Maharaj instruction, and then you were able to publish like 25 papers in three, 25, in three years. So basically, you mentioned that in the academic world, we need to have the language and the skills, otherwise we won't be respected. And if we are able to present our wisdom in a way that addresses today's problems, then there is a whole universe open over there. And especially in qualitative research, phenomenal, phenomenological approach, you know, we can actually, it's mainly a way of say, understanding our texts, studying the contemporary issues, and then applying for, uh, for solving, current, current, solving specific problems. If you do that, then there is a big area in this field, big, big opportunity in this field. And this field has not been that well explored. Even if there are devotees in that field, they're not really got into bringing about that dialogue between, say, Bhagavad Gita and modern, modern criminology or modern issues. And for those who want to do this kind of thing, on one side, the leadership needs to be less myopic and the devotees need to become more expert in creating space for themselves. And then finally, you talked about how ultimately to get people from that utilitarian philosophy to the transcendental, it's going to be the relationships that we develop. So we may give impressive wisdom, but we need to be accessible to people. And that relationship that are observing us by being with us, they will want to take up bhakti and then they can also experience Krishna. So uh, thank you very much for your time and your wisdom. So if any devotees are interested in this area, so can uh -huh. they, con uh, for guidance, can they contact you through your website? Yeah. How can, through your website, they, they can contact, contact me. You? you have my phone number. You can also give, give them my email. My email is bvs.bts8 at gmail.com. bvs.bts8 8, okay. at gmail.com. Yes, Maharaj. 
Thank you very much. So, thank you. I mean, I'm a liberal guy. I'm a liberal, you know, Swami. They, they, they should feel free to contact me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. It was wonderful having you on the Monks podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.